Right. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Chance to Ask Outdoor Theatre Stage Managers. Um, so today we have Ella and I as your hosts, and then we have three lovely panellists joining us. Unfortunately, our fourth panellist, Caitlin, is unable to make it this evening, but we still have these guys ready to share all of their experience with you all. So before we get started, we'd like to go over a little bit about how this evening will work. It will last for two hours, running until 8 p.m. Please be aware that the session is being recorded. You're welcome to have your camera on or off throughout, but we ask all attendees to please stay muted. If you have any questions during the session, please private message them to Coral, who will pass them on to us, and we'll work them into the discussion where possible. So without further ado, let's introduce our panelists. Can we start with Beth? Hi, um, thank you very much for having me guys. Um, my name's Beth Mann. Um, I'm the company and technical stage manager for uh, the Guildford Shakespeare Company, which is obviously in Guildford. Um, I've been doing this now with them full time um, since 2016. I also started my career in Guildford. I went to um, Guildford School of Acting. Um, I did a degree there, uh, then became a freelance, uh, freelance stage manager. Um, so working through the ranks, um, started off touring as an ASM um worked up to a dsm and then um was very lucky to um be off the job um csm over at guilford shakespeare and i've uh, been doing that ever since um and guilford shakespeare is a um site specific only um theater company so they only work in non-traditional venues so it's been um it's been a really cool and a good learning experience uh, for sure <laughs> excellent thank you let's go to casey hi everyone uh my name is casey hagwood i use she her pronouns uh, I am an American stage manager currently based in Florida. Uh, I've been a member of American Actors Equity Association since 2008, and I've primarily worked in uh, American regional theater across uh, the states. And for the last uh, six years, um, I've worked outdoors for a few Shakespeare festivals uh, in the Western part of the United States, primarily Idaho Shakespeare Festival and Lake Tahoe Shakespeare Festival, which are repertory companies. Um, and uh, for the rest of the year, I teach stage management at Florida State University, where I'm the head of the BA Bachelor Stage Management track there. Um, so I'm so excited to be here and to chat with all of you about um, the similarities and differences that might, uh, that might exist between all of our experiences, both in the States and, uh, and abroad. Thanks for having me. Thank you, and let's go to Ida. Right, it's a little bit difficult to follow up with that. Uh, <laughs> I uh, am a Rose Bruford College graduate. Uh, I don't necessarily have a very straight come out of college, uni, into ASM, etc. career prospect. I uh, started doing a little bit of different jobs, a little bit of crew, a little bit of stage management, company management. And then my crewing work kind of led me to meet similar people who worked in crew at Regent's Park. And then after working the first season in 2017 in Regent's Park on Oliver Twist, I was um, offered full-time, well, seasonal full-time job with them as Tech ASM in the next four following years. And uh, I would have loved to do it this year. However, I don't think I can because of COVID and the move to Manchester. But um, yeah, I've had uh, four great years with different shows, musicals and plays at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre, being their tech ASM. Other than that, I've also worked on Everybody's Talking About Jamie in the West End and on a few touring productions, as well as some small scale uh, production in off West End venues in London. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Well, without further ado, I guess we'll go on to the first question. Uh, so the first question which was submitted uh, is, how does working outdoors compare to working on indoor productions? And so, Beth, if you'd like to start us off on that one. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I would say uh, there's a couple of key points um, that are different uh, that you need to consider when working outdoors. Um, the first one is for me is always the facilities that are available. Um, that could be as simple as which building you're using if you're lucky enough to working in work in a sort of heritage gardens or something like that. Um, but it can be as basic as water, um, shelter, um, power, 
um, uh, and even just things like toilet facilities for your uh, cast and audience. Um, so that's sort of the basic point. So that's the first thing you've got to get lined up. Um, one of the other things is that you wouldn't have to so much think about um, in, in, in indoor venues is uh, the security of the venue. Um, you could be working in the middle of a park, um, bumping into the public, um, trying to explain why suddenly they can't take their dog through the same path that they normally take every Saturday. Um, and just trying to be really respectful of um, uh, the spaces that um, might be part of community uh, communities or um, remembering that, you know, you're uh, you're going in and using their space. Um, um, but yeah, the main ones are, where am I getting my water from? Where am I getting my electric from? And where am I going to put everybody? That's fair enough. Water and electric, <laughs> that's definitely necessary. Um, Katie, how about you for yourself? The, uh, Beth hit two really important ones in terms of, uh, of, of facilities and security. Um, I, I think for me, outdoor theater is is a different level of preparation. Um, uh, we here usually buy uh, sunscreen, bug spray, items in our stage management kind of inventory that you wouldn't necessarily need if you were working indoors, um, as well as um, making sure you have, you know, proper flashlights, like all, all of these things that, you know, you uh, you're going to be outside. What do you need in order for to keep people safe in terms of first aid kits, safety supplies, those types of things? Uh, and and I would also uh, say respect for animals and wildlife. Um, I have a story later that I'd love to share, but for now, I think that you know you have to acknowledge that you are you're working with Mother Nature, right? And there's going to be new elements. There's going to be animals. There's going to be plants that could be poisonous or that people need to stay away from. Um, and you know there also could be uh, unanticipated challenges. Like, is it too hot to rehearse a fight scene on the deck where people roll around? You know, and how do we make sure that we are troubleshooting as much in advance as possible in the event that um, something can't happen the way that we want it to? There's just additional variables. So I think thinking through uh, what are what are the options that exist if X happens and, and planning that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I um and Ida, I'm looking forward to that story as well. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I think what both Beth and Casey have said is is very valid and definitely all things we have to consider when working outdoors. I think a lot, especially in Regent's Park where I've worked as the Tech ASM, we have our venue, but on each production you have a stage management team who comes in with that production, and so they're usually quite you know, used to be in normal ASMs, if I can say it like that. And they have a very comfortable time in the rehearsal space. So when they come for the tech week, for the production week outside, we really have to uh, convey how outdoor theatre isn't like normal theatre in terms of prop storage, in terms of like the weather. You think that would be things that is on everyone's mind working outdoors but the amount of times that people forget that you know you can't have paper props on stage because if it suddenly rains how are you gonna deal with them paper props are you gonna get them off stage like we had a production of um midsummer night's dream in 2019 uh, where there was lots of instruments on stage and there's been a few times in regent's park where we have instruments on stage as soon as it starts raining that's on everyone's mind. How do you cover up the instruments? How do you get them off stage? Um, as well as like Casey pointed out, is it too hot to rehearse on stage if that stage is gonna be hot? On contrary, is it gonna be too slippery when it's wet? In Regent's Park, we constantly have show stops because of the rain and we have a certain time limit we have to keep within where we can go on squeegee the stage get it towel dry get the cast back on continue the show and so that's really a routine in regent's park that like the people who's worked there for a few seasons or like been on a few shows and come there again and again year after year they know that process we have favorite squeegees for like which one is the best one to get the stage dry um, head torches as well. You think sometimes in theatre that 
a head touch oh you know I'll, I'll just do with the blue lights it'll be fine I forgot it today or the battery ran out outdoor theatre you really need that head touch like there is no way you can just like find whatever you dropped on the ground amongst the leaf the branches and whatever lighting have left of cables in a mess like you need that head touch and uh, and I would say just on a slight stage and technical aspect as well it, you'll be surprised by the amount of dust pollen leaves and everything that is left on stage every time you come back it's not just a sweep of the stage once you might have to do it two or three times to prepare for a performance and in terms of your tools in terms of just leaving something and coming back for it no you have to plan ahead you have to know where you left your stuff because that is going to go with the wind quite quite literally all right thank you thank you very much so our next topic is moving on to weather um so how do you prepare for or react to the outdoor weather conditions that you have to work alongside let's start with casey Sure. So a um, couple of things that come to mind are um, for, for uh, elements are heat, too hot, um, rain. Uh, and uh, in one of my companies, we have uh, air quality, smoke and haze issues um, being on the Western coast of the United States. Um, so rain first, storms, lightning. Uh, if lightning is occurring, that's an automatic stop for, for all outdoor uh, venues that I've worked in. Um, if it rains, I, I am very fortunate to kind of work with a repertory acting company. And I usually look to my veteran actors uh, with my ASMs to say, you know, is this light drizzle? Everybody's still feeling safe. Everybody, you know, we're still checking in. Everybody feels good versus, okay, it's a downpour. We have to stop. Right. And understanding, engaging the safety of your company, like safety is number one. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you all have a lot more rain probably than we do. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll let my other panelists chat about that as well. Heat um, is a big thing to, to consider um, when working with, uh, with outdoor theater, primarily um, heat stroke, uh, making sure that people are hydrated, making sure that you have um, you know, electrolytes or, or things in your kit to make sure that you can, you can assist with anyone who might be experiencing dehydration. Um, as I mentioned before, is a stage too hot? Do you need to cut something in the show or in the rehearsal? in order to keep people safe. Um, and uh, in terms of smoke and haze here in the States, um, that's, that's a, a big problem in terms of air quality and that has canceled shows here, primarily in Oregon, California, Washington and those areas. And there's actually a, um, an air quality kind of chart that, that we go by to determine um, whether or not it's safe to perform and whether or not it's safe to have people outside based on um, health effects that could be caused by poor air quality, smokes and, and fires. Um, so those are, those are kind of, I think, um, the, 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 the bigger things. The only thing I wanna talk about in terms of rain, something that we do here is, um, my company has, so our prop tables, because we run in, in rep, our prop tables are laid out on bed sheets and they're taped out in that way so that we can just remove them quickly and then put them back on the tables. And above the, the, the bed sheets, we uh, usually clamp uh, large rolls of plastic or tarps and have them ready to drop down at any given moment on top of our prop tables, on top of any equipment that you know could get wet. Um, if you're doing a musical, as Ida kind of mentioned before, if you're doing a musical with instruments, microphones, live wires, anything like that, uh, you know, it could require a show stop a lot sooner than a show that does not have any of those things. Um, I also have done a show outside where the, the stage was AstroTurf, it was fake grass, and that became incredibly slippery for our performers. And that just required a different level of preparedness in the event that we started encountering any rain. 
Um, so I, I echo back to what Ida was saying earlier in terms of, you know, is the stage slippery? We do a lot of the squeegeeing too. Uh, we also do something called rain burn. I don't know if, if that's a term you all use, but we turn all the lights on in the theater and try to dry the deck um, as quickly as possible when we're holding. Can I just um, you called that, please? Rain burn. Rain burn. Okay, yeah, we have the, the rain, rain LXQ. We go, oh, okay. go to the rain queue, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, so, you know, it's the same thing. You know, we, we call oh, it rain burn. Too. Heat it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're just trying to dry the stage as quickly as possible. But I think it's, weather is often for me in terms of working outdoors is always about safety. Do people feel safe? Can we keep our show safe? You know, um, are, are, is there equipment that we need to, to make sure uh, isn't impacted by, by rain or, or certain elements? Um, and if you're in rehearsal, uh, you know, having layers of different clothing to protect you from sunburn, uh, also something I highly recommend, you know, um, hats, that kind of thing. We let people kind of wear long sleeve loose clothing uh, for, for outdoor afternoon rehearsals, just because it's a lot warmer typically during the day. Um, so I think weather ultimately equates to safety and whatever you have to do, you know, I have become so much more comfortable with show stops since working outdoors because it's just a part of the world and, and you have to be willing to stop and assess what's going on and assess safety. That's always better in outdoor theater than trying to keep going. Excellent. Let's go to Ida. Yeah, um, everything Casey kind of mentioned is is very true for outdoor theatre and working working with nature. It's like it's like Casey said, you have to work with nature rather than like work against it. So you know it's going to rain. Just get that tarp ready. Have it somewhere accessible. Always assess whether or not this is drizzle that is going to pass, or is it going to be a proper downpour? Um, and especially as we know here in the UK like that suddenly changes before you know it, you are drenched. And um, on that note, a lot of what has to be taken into consideration is not just stage management bits, because as, you, uh, as both Beth and Casey mentioned, you have to take into consideration the whole company and everyone who's working. So it becomes about everyone's safety. Like if it's raining, okay, we stop tech, we send the actors in, maybe lighting needs to do something. However, if it's raining, we don't really want to have the lighting people climb up the trusses. So then we have to wait until later. Again, that is another thing where normally in theater, in tech, you will have stops, you will have dinner breaks, etc. All the technical crew continue work while the cast is on break. That can't always happen in outdoor theater spaces because we'll be teching in the middle of the day. We'll start tech at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Whereas lighting will have to come in at 2 p.m. because they're working overnight to do the plot after midnight when it's dark enough. Uh, you have to always work with what kind of mother nature gives you. Like you can't change when the sun rises and when it goes down, that's just something you ought to work with. Um, and I know, I, I don't know about Beth and Casey, but in Regent's Park, it is kind of a running joke that um, everyone downloads and checks an app called Rain Today, because it's got really good perception of when the rain is gonna hit and you can pinpoint exactly on the map where you are so you can see the kind of the wave of rain coming and we're like, oh, is it going to go past us is it, or is it going to go over us? Oh, it's all exciting. Um, and funnily enough, when we were lucky enough to do Jesus Christ Superstar now in 2020, um, the Rain Today app didn't work as well as it normally does because it relies on the flight traffic to give information to the app about weather currents. So when we did it this year, it was completely off. And uh, there was a couple of days actually where we were running out frantically because out of nowhere, rain started pouring. The quick change tents that we had set up all gathered up water and collapsed. Everything had to go out. People were everywhere. Oh, I kid you not. And if you've ever tried to breed through a mask when it's soaking wet, it, it's it's like torture 
<laughs> it's just not something you want to do. And again, that is just to continue on like weather currents and things that you don't expect. Casey mentioned it, haze. It becomes an absolute nightmare when it's um, when it's wet in the air. So we're always on radio with our lighting people so that we can ask them to turn off the haze, to turn it up to whatever we need, depending on wind, depending on moisture in the air, uh, depending on, on heat, you know, like sometimes that really adds to the performance when they're dancing on stage, when they're really struggling and then suddenly they got all the haze in their face as well. Or if it's, if it's a low pressure and that heat hits the stage, because then obviously heat, um, haze, sorry, is just liquid. So if that goes down to the stage, it stays there and gets slippery. So then that becomes a hazard as well. Um, and yeah, like Casey said, with musicals, they obviously all have microphones. So as soon as it starts raining, that's part of stage management's job to hand out umbrellas, to hand out little caps to protect those mics um, for sound and for the cast as well. Uh, so yeah, there's there's lots to be discussed about wind, weather, everything of such conditions. Like um, on Avita in 2019 as well, the musical in Regent's Park, there was, um, for some reason, Jamie Lowe decided to have all of the pyro he could possibly put in. And uh, unfortunately, that was my responsibility. And part of that was, um, I think, at least six big confetti cannons as well as two big streamer cannons. Confetti, obviously, needless to say, when it's wind, it went all over Regent's Park. It did not stay just in our little stage area. And we got complaints from the Royal Majesty herself about littering in her park. Uh, we had streamers stuck in the trees and we had to go up long ladders with six meter long sticks trying to grab it out. It just, it, Sometimes you also have to remind designers and directors this is not possible because of weather conditions. We also had Hansel and Gretel where we did a live interval change on stage, forming a house into this bare kind of woodland kind of inspired, you know, set <laughs> and uh yeah when it's raining obviously that interval change slows down because it's slippery it's dangerous you can't do much and if you can't tech that then suddenly you've lost a whole day just because of rain and that's another thing rain or sunshine you're gonna lose time because actors are overheating and shoving little you know ice packs down their costumes to keep afloat or you have to suddenly send another actor on because the other one is puking in the corner from heat stroke like these are the things you have to be prepared for that you just can't think of um when you're in a normal theater we also had an actor who inhaled a bug so she had to go off stage she couldn't continue <laughs> That is great advice, especially about the confetti. Um, <laughs> let's go over to Beth. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, lots of brilliant, brilliant points there. Um, I, I've just made a couple of um, n notes about maybe some practical um, things that we found really useful um, with the weather. Obviously, lots of rain. Um, I'd, uh, I've had that exact um, point of coming in to your to set up and finding your gazebo looking like an upside down spider and thinking, where am I going to put my company? Um, uh, the solution for that is, is buying better gazebos. Uh, I cannot stress to you the difference between a Amazon gazebo and a, a 500 to 600 pound gazebo, which uh, invest in gazebos and tarps. That's it. That's it. You can basically do pull up. I mean, if I could do a pull up, um, <laughs> you could do pull ups on the inside of these gazebos. Uh, that's the best investment. I think we've, we've made in a long time for our outdoor shows. They're, they're so brilliant. Um, no more taping mops to the oh, roof yeah. to make them uh, to make them go like that anymore. Um, so that's been brilliant. Um, in terms of the stage, um, yeah, slip it, sl slipping is obviously a massive, massive um, thing you have to watch out for um, with rainy seasons. Um, we found it quite useful to put a slight gradient on the stage um, to allow water to run off. Um, um, it also not, it's nice because you can see a bit more of the floor. Um, non-slip lino has been a godsend um that's we use that almost exclusively out, outdoors now um 
we discovered it a few years ago after a um a beautiful checkerboard floor that had been painted onto boards and glazed with um like a gritted non-slip glaze um tried to get that through a a, a get in that it rained for the entire get in uh, and the water just bore through it and um and it went so um yeah so a little trip to the b later and non-slip bathroom lino uh has been brilliant and we've used that almost exclusively now for the last couple of years um um, um, Casey was mentioning about um, dust and actually for the first time ever a couple of years ago we, we experienced that at one of our venues because it was so dry and the, pla the, the space we were playing on um, was very muddy and the, there was very little grass there so we ended up having to wet the stage um, they were just playing on, on grass um, which was a very odd experience for us when we were having such beautiful sunny days and we were going around with a, basically a glorified water pistol um, trying to dampen it down so that the dust didn't fly up um, can so I that was a that? odd one, yeah. <laughs> when when stages are really hot, we do that as well. We water mm. the stage to cool it down before the act. Ah. So that it's funny that you used it with dust and stuff. But yeah, yeah, sometimes if it's like you know the forty degrees heat wave we had in two thousand nineteen or something. Yes, in that day in Regent's Park was crazy. Well, I've never been wetter from sweat. <laughs> <laughs> having having some water sprinklers just on yeah. stage to cool it down and make it ready for the actors made all the world of a difference <laughs> it was it was a little different for us because we um we were working a venue with no running water so it, um it felt very bizarre um sprinkling uh basically evian um <laughs> no, not the not evian the costco equivalent um onto the floor uh felt very strange um but it did work um and that was good um uh, also, um, you mentioned about ice packs, Ida. Um, yes, 2019 was the hottest summer season we've ever tried to achieve. Um, we had a paddling pool in the dressing yeah. room. Paddling uh, pool with um, balloons, uh, freezed with ice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes, then, yes, and yes. And then uh, flannels for the actors. Yes. Obviously, that made it more difficult now in 2020 with COVID. Yeah. We had like little buckets with water balloons uh, all frozen mm. and flannels, but we had to like have a used bucket, a new bucket of flannels. Right. And touch it and mix it. That's really, yeah, it's good. It's good. That's I think that's what we're heading into um, for sure. Um, and ice lollies. Oh, Never I, have ice lollies been uh, so glorious, like for a bunch of adults who, I mean, <laughs> do you like a coffee? No. Would you like an ice lolly? Yes. <laughs> so that was that was a good one this year. Um, the other thing we do is um, we have clear ponchos, which are the most uh, fashionable things you can imagine. Um, but they're brilliant just in, in that sort of drizzly rain that's a bit persistent, but um, isn't isn't heavy enough to cause any other issues um clear ponchos um just mean that they just can be a bit more comfortable and their lovely costumes are still visible um because that's the other thing is it, after a designer spent so long making them look so amazing and uh, such brilliant period costumes um it'd be a shame for them to just have to put coats on and uh, lose that so that's been really that's been really popular um apart from quick changes as you can imagine wet ponchos not so good um but that's a nice little um save just to keep just to keep them comfortable and to stop that sort of damp feeling setting in because it especially on a two-show day it's um, um it's really important to keep people obviously comfortable and and happy um uh, and and rain breaks as well we're quite a small company so we don't tend to stop unless it becomes unsafe um our audiences are fully behind us on that um we say you know when you're booking tickets we are all weather um all weather theater company we don't cancel unless it becomes unsafe um so unless you can no longer hear the uh, cast because the rain is so heavy um or or it becomes too no too heavy too too unsafe underfoot um and that's the only time we will pause the show but we have found rain breaks are quite help helpful so just taking a little pause um getting the audience somewhere comfortable and, sh and sheltered with their umbrellas getting the cast back to the dressing rooms taking a minute seeing what's happening um and then often that'll only be for about sort of five ten minutes and often we can continue again and bring out the old squeegees yeah and, uh, yeah and uh, and then be able to continue which is great um, yeah, I love what you mentioned about um, the audiences benefiting from the rain break as well, mm. because I think that's the most important part of outdoor theatre. You can't forget about the audiences. There has been 
so many times where we've had to have show stops because audiences are having heat strokes because they're sat in that sun too. Mm. And they're just sat there drinking their Pims or Prosecco, you know, forgetting about sun cream, forgetting about umbrellas. And they just go, they drop like flies. We've had ambulances in, we've had actors standing on stage going, please can we have a show stop? There's a lady struggling here. Like we are always on cans on radio with actors about the audiences as well. Mm, and that definitely. is so, so important because the rain for audiences is also, it, ta- it tears them down. Yeah, they get, they get really grumpy. If you just send them off, get them umbrellas, send them to the bar, get them drunk. They are so much more happy. <laughs> I was going to say as well, Ida, um, when you were talking about um, paper props on stage, I say it's the only it's the only time um, in a what has now been quite a long a long old career uh, since I left drama school where I've laminated a newspaper. <laughs> um, it felt very odd at the time, um, but it's a lifesaver. Um, so you don't have to make a hundred copies. Yeah. Um, so you just break out your wet weather um, newspaper. Um, and I think Casey, you were saying the similar thing um, about um, wet, wet, I say wet, wet weather options um, is also having that um, wet weather blocking, uh, wet weather fights, wet weather footwear. Um, all of these things um, are sort of worked into our tech rehearsals. So um, uh, and that decision is, is made with with the producers and the cast um, uh, and looking at the weather and what it's going to be like. And we just say we everyone stops and we go, right, wet weather fights, please, everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and that's what we do. And, 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 and also wet weather blocking is really important because if you have got a wet stage, that's just drizzly stage, it's not unsafe. And you've got to see my son's about to have to lie down on the floor. You know, that's just, it's just not really, um, that's just not really okay to our son to do that. So, um, also thinking about those little bits and pieces and yeah, not having someone in a, a glorious white dress rolling around on a muddy floor. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, we had that issue on on Evita because towards the end of the show, um, oh, not Peron, the other one, and T, whatever he's called, um, he gets covered in blood. But obviously, Jamie Lloyd wanted it fancy, so he did it in paint. Uh, so it was drenched in paint, only in his knickers, and laying on stage for a solid twenty minutes, not moving. When it's raining, when it's cold, because that musicals at Regent's Park is usually August to September. So it really gets cold end of September. So our solution then was either to give him more costumes to wear or we installed a heater under, because luckily the staging was like a a staircase. So we installed it under the seat where he was going to be and he could we had a special cue with lighting where we're like, go. He's laid down, put the heater on, go. <laughs> so again, like Beth said, costume alterations and blocking alterations for weather. Peter Pan, they were doing counter flying uh, up trusses and stuff. If it's raining, if it's lightning, you can't really do that. So then you're just have to change the blocking and you have to work around it, get actors off it if it's raining. Sometimes um, you can't plan these things either. Actors will just come off if they're sat there for five minutes in drenched rain. They will, they will protest, they will complain, and they will just come off. So just be prepared for that. You also bring up an, an interesting thing about costumes that I just want to touch on for a moment, because I have done outdoor shows where we have specialty costumes that cannot get wet, or there are certain fabrics that, um, you know, if it rains, we, we need to change those performers into something or get them into a poncho. Um, and, and I think that goes back to kind of the preparation and, and how does working with outdoor theater vary? Uh, because um, my, my primary two outdoor companies have a sister company in, that's indoor. So the productions go back and forth, the same productions between an indoor venue and an outdoor venue. And sometimes the designer forgets to plan for some of the outdoor stuff and focuses on the indoor venue. And so then you have, you know, we did a production um, a a couple of years ago that had um, these like beautiful like silk dresses that, you know, if they got wet, they were ruined. And so, you know, there was a question in kind of 
the beginning of the tech process in terms of what are what are the protocols for these costumes. Um, same, I did a production of The Tempest a couple of years ago where the specialty costumes for the, I think it was like the, are they the fairies? The, the There's that scene in, you know, in Tempest, so I, I forget, the magical creatures in The Tempest um, that, that had very special costumes for that one scene. And um, we actually had to create special ponchos for them. Um, the our, our, I won't tell you what we called them because it's a little obscene, but they were kind of these uh, phallic shaped kind of, uh, you know, these cylinders that went on, you know, each of the costumes and, and we'd have to put them on because it would rain. They could not get a drop of rain, but the costumes were beautiful. We wanted them to be seen, but we would, if we knew rain was coming, it was like, okay, go ahead and put them in their, in their ponchos, because if it rains, we want to make sure that they're, they can stay on stage and that we don't have to, you know, stop the show. So I think costumes, you know, is one of those departments that can be really impacted by the weather and um, that, that you really have to have a game plan and, and know as a stage manager, like what are specialty items that really can't get wet or shouldn't get wet. And Beth mentioned shoes, the importance of rubbering shoes on an outdoor deck or not putting people in shoes that are dangerous heels. If you have, you know, slits or slats in your outdoor deck, you know, there's so many safety issues as well as kind of protections that are in place when it comes to, to costumes and footwear. Mm, yeah, just so, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention about footwear in Regent's Park. We work with resin, so we have this resin uh, in boxes by all entrances, so actors can stamp their feet in the resin before they go on stage because it adds a little bit extra of grip before they go on stage, uh, and that's again something that works hugely, but also works hugely for actors' mentality. Because if they know they've got resin on their feet, they're like, oh, okay, I'm fine on the stage. If they don't, they're like, it's super slippery. I can't go on. I'm like, okay, here's a box of resin. Now go on. And and it, it, it works wonders. Just wanted to add that. That's a really good point. And, and actually, we've had venues where um, we've, we've had to insist to the designer what footwear will be acceptable um just because of the conditions so one of the venues the, the one where we have no no facilities no water or anything no electric um it, it's such rough terrain it's, it's beautiful um but we had to say right from the beginning it's, it's got to be boots it's got to be almost hiking boots for them to get around the terrain that they need to need to get around because otherwise it won't be safe um so, so actually the venue actually impacted the design um which is like which is something that um obviously is very rare um indoors um so that was an interesting one <laughs> luckily it was robin hood so they got away with boots oh that's perfect then <laughs> uh those are all such good points the points that i made notes which is great <laughs> um uh we're just going to move on to the next topic if that's okay which is about venues um and so this sort of comes in two parts and so the first part is what has been your favorite venue to work in and why um, and then the second part is about environmental and historically, historically, sorry, significant venues and what theatre companies can do to reduce their impact on the site. So if you want to answer both of those at the same time, or if you want to answer one, then the other, it's completely up to you. Uh, how about we start with Ida? Um, so I don't really have much venues to choose from, seeing as I've only been in Regent's Park. So top up. Regent's Park, that's my favourite. <laughs> um, but in terms of environmentally, um, being environmentally conscious, we're quite lucky in Regent's Park because we do have a certain set staging and audience area. So that really can't change. If you, if you really wanted to change it, you could probably work around it with stage decking and, and changing certain things. Um, but there's certain trees in the venues that has to be, and it's encouraged to be uh, brought into the design. And that often comes with lighting designers. So they have to put lights in areas far, far away from the stage, just, just to do some up lighting of the trees and to really emphasize on the nature around you. Cause that is what they really want to 
to emphasize in Regent's Park. They want the audience to feel they're outside, but still have the quality of a production of an indoor theater. They want everyone on stage and off stage, backstage and, and in the audience to, to feel the weather conditions. That's why we don't have any, uh, we don't have any roof backstage, even though we do have a backstage area. But the reason for this is also so that the staging can be pushed further into the wings. We can kind of play with the area we're given, even though there are certain trees, obviously we can't cut down. And because it's part of the Royal Parks, we legally can't really do much with the trees and stuff. So we have to have tree surgeons come in and do some work on the trees to make sure that they're happy again after each season, after lighting has climbed up and ruin them and all of this. And again, lighting and sound, and especially crew that you hire on a daily basis, you have to remind them, lighting tape does not decompose in nature. Pick it up. Like I know when they're in indoor theater, they just rip it off, they push it on the ground, they go, oh, stage managers will sweep that up in a minute. That doesn't happen, it gets lost with the leaves. And so, I think one of the changes we did in the two last years in Regent's Park is that we went over to reusable um, cable ties. So that's again, something you can do to reduce your impact. Uh, you'll use whatever you have around you. So instead of building some kind of new mechanism to get something up, we're using the trees uh, to use points for speakers going down on stage. We're using what is around us rather than building everything to fit the stage. Um, so yeah, that's really all I've got to say on that, <laughs> that one. Thank you so much. I didn't even, I never even thought of reusable cable ties. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, perfect, okay. Uh, Casey, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so my favorite venue is um, one that I've worked in since uh, 2016. It's the Lake Tahoe Shakespeare Festival, which uh, Lake Tahoe is on the border, half of it's in California, the other half is in Nevada. Um, and uh, it's in a state park, and uh, which I'll talk about in a minute with sustainability. Um, but uh, it's at 6,500 feet elevation. So we're kind of up um, higher. And uh, so it gets nice and chilly at night. Um, we are closer to the sun, so we do experience a lot more sunburn and, and that sort of thing. But um, the view is worth it. It's, uh, you know, it, the mountains still have snow on them in the summer because they're so high up. And um, it's the, the stage, um, backstage is essentially the, the lake. Um, and it comes with its own challenges because people, it's a tourist destination. So people are, on the beach, you know, enjoying on boats, you know, enjoying kind of the landscape and we kind of have to partition off where the theater begins and ends so that we don't have uh, a, a lot of drunk people on vacation just kind of wandering through the backstage area. Um, and it, I love it because it's quirky and it has its own challenges and um, but it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. And, uh, and, and I just consider myself really fortunate to, to work there. Um, this is where my story comes in with sustainability. I have a couple of things to say about this. The first is um, I wanna talk a little bit about wildlife and, and animals, because I think that that's such a huge part of sustainability and working outdoor and you know, conserving our wildlife. Tahoe has uh, hundreds of indigenous black bears. And so part of our training when we get to Lake Tahoe every year is to do bear awareness training. And we learn what to do when you encounter a bear. Um, and part of the training is very much about trash because bears are attracted to food. We do have a restaurant with the, the Shakespeare Festival um, that has a wired fence that is electrified every night. Um, the food it has to be stored a really particular way. And all of the trash cans are called bear boxes and they are metal trash bins that you kind of have to stick your hand into and like open in a very particular way so that a bear can't open it. And usually they have like chains or, or something that you have to unlock in order to put your trash away. Um, and there's a big kind of environmentally conscious um, 
uh, awareness in Lake Tahoe and the slogan is keep Tahoe blue, keep the lake blue. And they are, they are really invested in um, making sure that people are trying to protect the bears by not leaving trash because the minute that someone starts feeding the bear or the bears acknowledge that there's easy food, um, they have to, to uh, put them down because the bear can no longer sustain its own living anymore. It's now been trained to rely on humans for food. So there's a big, uh, you know, kind of push to make sure that you're really conscious about your trash, um, your, your recycling, how you're, uh, you know, utilizing the, the resources that, that the venue has to offer. Um, one thing we do is uh, we try to eliminate plastic waste as much as possible. So we actually give the company their own water bottles every year. And so that they can fill up without having to, to use plastic water bottles. Um, so, so we'll always try to find ways to, to reuse certain things, you know, or, or try to eliminate plastics and waste as much as possible. Um, the other thing we do um, is uh, there's a landscaper on staff in our venue. So they will make sure that um, the flowers and the, the grass, like everything is, is protected within um, the national park and, uh, you know, any trees that need to be trimmed or anything like that. Um, but I agree with Ida. We use a lot of kind of the natural landscape. A lot of our sets have kind of open uh, design so that people can kind of see the lake behind the, the actors and really immerse themselves in the experience. And I think that's what's so lovely about outdoor theater is, is the experience that it gives you, you know, and just kind of immersing yourself in that in that natural environment so um so yes sorry for my long-winded answer but that's kind of my favorite as well as uh how we're trying to remain as as sustainable and and uh ecologically conscious as possible oh absolutely do not apologize for the answer it's an amazing one um and beth i mean we, we don't have bears but we do have persistent ducks um at one of our venues so I mean, if you're doing the importance of being earnest in the castle gardens and you're trying to make cucumber sandwiches every day, I can tell you, they know, and they come flocking. Um, <laughs> we also have a very lovely uh, um, uh, Robin who we, we, we are sure is the same Robin every year for the last 15 years um, called Barry, um, who will periodically um, perch on the set and the entire audience will focus their full attention on the Robin until the Robin has left. So uh, <laughs> sometimes the actors just go. Yeah, he's brilliant. He's great. He is great. Um, uh, best venue. Um, I keep talking about uh, the Robin Hood's um, venue, um, even though it's the most difficult. Um, and I don't mean to scare you because I know that's the venue that uh, Kira's going to this summer, um, but it is incredible. It, it's absolutely beautiful. It's a completely um, wonderful discovery. Most people don't know it's there in Guildford. You you sort of come across one of the entrances and you think what what's what what, what goes on in there? And it's just a huge park, um, very hilly, um, lots of trees, um, very steep sides, you sort of come out into a big kind of almost like a bowl in one of the areas and it's completely surrounded by trees. Um, and, and yeah, one of my favourite moments was was basically building Sherwood Forest um, into that space um, with with a real rope bridge um which which just sort of turned all the uh all the adults back into kids um we had a um a haze machine sort of buried in the floor so it was a like a smoking uh campfire um yeah big tree tree bridge and tree swings and um yeah just really spectacular um and then and then yeah as, as landscapes go the other, one of our other venues is um near guildford castle so uh, you've got your your show and your and your backdrop is uh, a, a castle and it always sunsets behind the behind the stage. So, yeah, we've been very lucky with some of our venues. Um, I can't speak much to um, to the environments because it's been it's it's been fairly straightforward for us. We're, as I say, we're we're not a big company, um, um, but um, trying to treat trying to treat the trees and the nature as as best we can. Um, obviously, using things like um, sort of padded. Um, straps whenever we're working with trees to make sure that there's no that they're not damaged um, if we are using them to brace anything um, making sure that we take a little bit of extra care when we're leaving the site if we've had to do anything like dig out for um, cable runs um, making sure we take time to treat treat the grass respectfully and make sure it's been tapped down properly and watered um, and working with the grounds team most of the places we go to have 
um, have a team who look after it. So sort of liaising with them and making sure that um, we're sort of following their protocols and that um, we're not leaving any area um, in, a, in a way that it wouldn't be able to recover. Um, one of the most common things is is the, where the chairs are, you know, just, just the grass in general. Um, you can sort of, you know, you can see where the grass has grown taller underneath all our chairs. So when you take all the chairs away, you have like a little auditorium left where the grass is all long. Um, but it only takes a couple of months and then you'd never know we were there. Um, so, yeah, I would say most just being respectful of the, the spaces we work in and, and sort of trusting to the, the knowledge of the people who work there all year round to make sure we we're doing it right, basically. Just to add to what uh, Beth and Casey has already mentioned, a, a big part, obviously, of working outdoors and in these different venues is, as they've mentioned, the animals around it. Because you have to remember, before you were there, they were there. Uh, so we, we don't actually have ducks, but we do have very persistent pigeons. And every time there's food on stage, and boy, is there food on stage often, they are a nightmare. And stage management always forgets about this because, again, in theatres, you can just leave the food on the props table and it'll be fine. No, squirrels will find it, pigeons will find it, and they will follow the actors on stage to get that food. Um, and in terms of what Beth said about the seating, that doesn't just happen in uh, grass. I actually had a very funny moment on Little Shop of Horrors where again, it was really hot that summer of 2018, certain days. And uh, during tech, I had my chair in a specific position the whole time because I was doing automation. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't quite have enough cameras. So I was forced to put like a, a see-through lighting gel over a very dodgy camera on my side and mark with a Sharpie where the stops of this big truck was going to happen and just kind of press the button, wait for it to come there on my screen and then stop pressing it. And then that's that's where it would stop. And so because I was so concentrated on this during this hot, hot tech, I did not notice that my chair melted into the asphalt in that exact position <laughs> because it was so hot. But at least that meant I always knew where to sit to get that measurement completely correct. Um, but we also, as mentioned, dealt with the animals. Uh, we have a fox family that lives under the stage in Regent's Park. So every year when it comes to around April and we start getting back into run of things, we uh, unfortunately kind of have to usher them out or kind of get them to leave the stage area for their own safety. Uh, not that, you know, they want to be there when the builders are doing their thing and clanking the metal. Uh, but we did have a bit of a run in with a rabies fox who, again, nearly made it onto stage during Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, if it hadn't been for the fact that I was sat on the stage left entrance with my automation desk and the company manager on cans just went, Ida, look to your left and make it go away. I was like... Okay. <laughs> so again, you have to you have to be prepared to work with the animals because they uh, were there first. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, so our next topic is looking at the production processes. Um, we're looking especially here at how the rehearsal process and then the transition into the venue um, differs from your conventional venues and your indoor productions. So let's start with Casey, please. Oh, sure. Um, so I, um, for us, um, and this might be a little different, so I'm so interested to hear uh, uh, the other answers too, in terms of how, how you all do it um, at your companies, but um, we typically rehearse indoors um, while we stage the show. We have a, a typical rehearsal hall that functions in the same way as an indoor space. And then um, there will come a point in the process, usually after a designer run, when the show is ready to, to move, uh, where we, we move to stage. And typically uh, what we do is, sorry, my cat's paw is on my computer and I'm worried she's gonna just power it right off. Um, but um, we hit a point, as I said, where we move to the stage. And on the first day, it's usually about acclimating the company. Um, and we typically do an afternoon session uh, where we do no costumes 
and uh, people can wear whatever they feel comfortable in. And we will kind of roll through um, the, the show uh, without lights with um, and try to get the scene changes nailed down um, as well as anything else that needs to be looked at like uh, respacing fights, respacing dances, um, anything that can be done in the daylight. And then typically we do an evening session where lighting is usually the focus and we kind of work on their timeline in terms of um, what they wanna see and kind of moving through the show as we tech it. Um, we, if we're not doing um, an eight out of 10 or a 10 out of 12 in the system that I just said, um, we do a, what's called a straight six where we'll go from 6 p.m. to midnight and uh, the cast will get in the costume right away if we're doing that schedule. And then we'll start, you know, top of show and kind of move our way through with lighting. The biggest thing that I think changes for us in outdoor theater is that once we get through the show, um, or even if we don't, like if it's night two, it, it depends a little bit on the schedule, but if it's night two of tech and say that our curtain is 7.30, like we're gonna do 7.30 performances for the whole summer, we will work on things from six to 7.30. And then regardless of where we are, we stop and start top of show again. So that the designer can see what the show's gonna look like in the proper lighting for act one. And then we will resume with whatever we didn't get to in act two when it's fully dark and then do any notes after that. And then once we get into dress rehearsals and previews, um, the same thing kind of applies where after the show, the actors will take a break and we will plan to do lighting notes with the company um, on stage before we release them for the night. So the, I think for us, the biggest thing is um, you know, we we have to be cognizant of the fact that lighting is so impacted by the amount of time we're on the stage. And um, I believe this was mentioned earlier, they usually stay into the night after rehearsal ends and continue programming or making their own adjustments so that when we come in the next day, they can see, uh, you know, what what everything looks like in real time. But I'd say the biggest adjustment is using the afternoon or any daylight hours to really make sure that you've nailed down anything else that can be looked at that won't take time away from the evening. And the evening can really be focused on how do we program the lights and, and, and what, does that, um, what does that look like? And the other thing that we encounter too is um, the, the sunset time changes, right, throughout the summer. And so the show starts to look a little bit different as you have been running it for six, seven, eight weeks. And sometimes it's also a matter of going back to the designer and saying, hey, I think we need to add a little bit of front light on the scene because it's now a lot darker than it was two months ago. And I, I think we need to make an adjustment. So those are things that you also don't really have to account for in indoor theater that might occur in outdoor theater is that the sunset time will impact how the show looks if it's a long running show and that there might be some maintenance tweaks um, that that you don't usually have to make in tech. So um, that, that's kind of my thoughts on, on what's what's the most different. Excellent, thank you. Let's go over to Ida. Uh, yeah, so totally agree with the lighting stuff. Uh, we have to regularly put in sessions where lighting designers come back and have a look at it because actors as well will throughout the summer, they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, that blue light backstage is fine. And then two months later, they're like, okay, this is really dark and I can't see anything. So then you always, it's it's like ever, it never settles outdoor theaters um, and their productions. It, it never comes into that routine where you're just like, oh, okay, finally the show is going like this and all of that, because every day the weather changes and then if the weather doesn't change, then seasonally you'll start getting more pollen on stage or the pollen will turn to leaves. And then in terms of prop storage and stuff like that, you get bird shit everywhere. So just get ready to bring your hot mops out because that's going to be all over your props, all over your sets, all over everywhere. Um, and yeah, in Regent's Park, it's very similar. We do um, rehearse inside. We're very lucky to have rehearsal uh, venues on site. Uh, so it's simply a matter of 
moving them from this one house to the stage. Um, but you'll be surprised to see, as, as a normal theatre, designers, actors, director, they all forget about the backstage route. And especially outdoor theatre, you think it's going to take 20 seconds to go there, go there, and then go back to stage. But it takes longer. And uh, you'll have to, yeah, you'll have to start by bringing them all out showing them all the low branches, all the dangerous areas, say, don't trip over here, take it slow. If you run backstage, you're doing it wrong. Always tell us on stage if you feel uncomfortable. Like, nobody should ever run backstage ever, especially not outdoors, because things will fall, there will be branches in the way, and you will forget about that one cable that you can't just run past, you know, like... Um, so yeah, we do start with an afternoon session, like Casey said, just taking them around, doing certain bits on stage during tech. We uh, tend to do the full rehearsal in a separate venue, and then we literally move in for tech week uh, in Regent's Park. So as tech ASM for me, that means I never get to see the, the shows in rehearsal. I only just get them. Uh, for the last few days when I changed them over from the rehearsal room onto stage. Um, and yeah, they, they do just kind of all forget that we're going to do this outside. Uh, both uh, stage managers and actors will all forget about it. And um, you just have to remind them of all the things that you think is very obvious. Uh, you have to remind them to have sunscreen, to do bug spray, uh, to have extra layers uh, when it comes to nighttime, uh, sun hats in the morning on tech nights. Um, and yeah, when it comes to the darkness, you got to work around lighting because that, that is the only time they have. Uh, and in the daytime, we do more tech stuff. Usually it's a bit more relaxed during tech in the morning and afternoon in outdoor theatre, I find, because you don't necessarily always have to be in your costumes. You don't necessarily always have to um, go from A to B to C um, and like in, in a certain pattern, you kind of work with what is ready on stage because again, the fit up might be impacted by weather. Um, on Hansel and Gretel, it just rained. It just rained for the whole tech week and there was no way of getting around it. Uh, so the whole tech for the opera had to be done with a massive, uh, as we call it, the Sunday tent, because it only used to be used on um, Sundays for a special event. But we had to put this big tent over the stage and they couldn't do any of the rehearsed scene changes and, you know, luckily for us, that was all cast scene changes. So not being able to tech that was really, really difficult. Uh, it was a rotating stage as well. So again, they'll just forget when they go off that, oh shit, I'm in nature, you know, I gotta dash that, I'm gonna turn around this tree and then I'm gonna go back over this side. They, they just, I don't know what it is about being outside, but they just forget where entrances and exits are sometimes. I think it's the green leaves. They must, <laughs> they must get very confused by all the leaves. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of plastic boxes as well to keep things safe uh, for stage management at least. And storage, it's just, you have to think about storage because in the rehearsal room, it's all inside. You can shove it all in the corner. That's like the stage management corner. But you're suddenly outside. You have to think about prop storage within the set. If that's waterproof, uh, you have to have tarps of your props tables. You have to consider where the props table is going to be because of the masking issues that also comes with being outdoors. Because if you're going to have blue lights backstage, then that's very visible through the trees for the audiences. So then suddenly that's an added layer of uh, almost like losing a bit of the backstage space that you have because either you have to use masking flaps or you have to use camo netting to kind of 
thicken out the bushes so that the audiences can't see so clearly through it. Um, and yeah, you just basically have to be prepared for, for a lot of things. And I think one of the key things for stage management is knowing that your props are going to be very far in between where they need to be on stage. They're not going to be just around the corner because it has to be waterproof, windproof, sunproof, bird proof. Like you can't, you can't just store things and leave it overnight. You have to always pack it down, take it into a safe space, pack it out in the morning. And, um, and like Casey said, often outdoor theater, you'll have various hours uh, that isn't similar to indoor theater. So techs in Regent's Park usually start at 9 a.m and run all the way to 11 p.m. And for a lot of actors and also crew, because crew usually come in then at 8 a.m. And unfortunately we have to leave the site at 11 a.m. But if you stay there until after midnight, you get taxis home. Um, but yeah, it just makes for very, very long days because you're out there in the sunshine. Suddenly you get a little bit of drizzle in the afternoon and then you have to stay there with the mosquitoes in the nighttime and it's dark and you're miserable and you're probably a little bit sunburnt from the earlier in the day. You know, it, it really is difficult when it comes to Tech Week and moving that production that was so comfortable in a rehearsal space to the actual venue that you're gonna be spending time with. Um, and it's, it's a big transitional process for both crew and cast where you just have to kind of keep the positivity a little bit and stop the negativity, I think is very important because it's very easy for people to start complaining about weather, about dust, about bird poo, et cetera. So it's, yeah, be prepared and be positive when it comes to moving that rehearsal to tech week. Thank you. I, I suppose all those site tours and the health and safety talks become all the more important in these kind of venues. Let's go over to Beth. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just made a couple of notes, like, uh, again, um, all amazing points. Um, mine is sort of, again, sort of practical things, I suppose, um, hopefully is, is sort of useful. Um, so we will always do a site visit with the company on the first day of rehearsals. Um, so we always finish our rehearsals a little bit early. Um, we transport the, the cast over to the site um, and we go and have a good explore and a look around. And, and normally what we do is present the designs to the cast in the venue, um, especially if we're, we're doing a promenade um, performance so that they can get a real clear picture in their heads of what each space will be and, and sort of what it will look like. Um, we'd also then put up sort of um, computer mock-ups of, of what the stage will look like with photos rather than just relying on drawings in the rehearsal room. So we take a photo of each um, section that we'll be working in and do just sort of like a computer mock-up of what the stage looks like to stick up in rehearsals so they can kind of keep that in their head. Um, site maps is also really important um, for them, um, where their journeys are, where their entrances and exits are. Um, so that's just another practical thing in the rehearsal room for them to have um, as well. Um, um, also, obviously, when you're working in multiple spaces in one venue, um, having a multi-layered, multi-coloured um, uh, markup is essential. Um, and also, um, oftentimes, um, you won't have a rehearsal room big enough, um, so you end up having to do sort of annotations for people. So um, a continuation of this line up into another 1.5 metres, um, just to try and give the director the chance to um, sort of figure out exactly what space they've got when they're in a smaller rehearsal room. Um, um, just before we go into tech week, um, what we tend to do is, uh, well, I, well, what I tend to do is send out um, a venue information sheet, um, which comes out with their, with the cast's um, production schedule. So that basically gives them the full rundown of um, the site, nearest parking, nearest train station, um, what's around as well, because it could be that, um, you know, where's the nearest shop it could be 15 minutes walk away. Um, and also a list of all the facilities that we're providing on site so that they can be prepared for what might be missing. So we endeavour to provide um, a kettle on site um, and a microwave, um, um, as well as uh, obviously um, toilet facilities, hand wash facilities. Um, if there's no running water, we provide um, bottled water. 
Um, uh, and the other thing that we found really useful is um, um, having a, um, a voice coach um, come in and do a session in the space, um, which is something we've sort of discovered more and more over the last couple of years, really. Um, and having them do a sort of a whole afternoon session with a full company in the space where they'll be standing um, and just working that through with a vocal uh, sort of a vocal coach just to um, get a sense of what that would be like because obviously um, uh, it's very different from working indoors um, we do try and help with mics and things but it's uh, we feel it's important for them to have a chance to speak the words in the space before we go into tech week because um, otherwise that can be a bit of a, a bit of a shock um, uh, and then uh, yes like, like the other two ladies were saying um, when we get into tech week um, the first thing I'll do is uh, health and safety talk um, and then a set walk. So that basically means they follow me around uh, over every entrance and exit, up, up every set of stairs, um, around every walkway. Um, uh, and we normally do that in their, in their cast shoes. So they've got a chance to experience that as well um, in the shoes I'll be wearing in the show. We try every, every possible place, check for, check for any issues. And then we give them some free time, normally about 10, 15 minutes. Um, to continue their explorations, maybe chart their first entrance, just to just try that, just to give us a jump start on the start of tech. Because as you all know, the first five minutes of the play takes about an hour, um, no matter how you do it. So um, that's that's helped limit that a little bit, just so they don't feel um, uh, uh, yeah quite so sort of jump sort of jumped into the, into the unknown. Um, uh, and it, yeah, and it just helps them feel a bit more comfortable, and also for them to have the time to go. Oh my goodness, that's now green, or um, oh that little shed's really cute, or oh you put a little prop seagull up on that branch, and to let them have those moments before we're trying to concentrate and do um, concentrated work. So uh, yeah, I'd say that. That's great advice. Um, so we've got some great live um, questions coming from the live chat. Before we move on to them. Um, did any of you have anything else you wanted to touch on about how the role in company management and company care changes as we move into outdoor venues? I think we covered it quite a lot, didn't we? I think we've, we've spoken so much about it's a different care kit. Um, I think like Casey was saying, uh, well, both, well, everyone's been sort of saying it's it's having those things, it's having the sun cream, it's having it's having ice packs, it's having uh, enough enough mosquito spray to uh, yeah, provide a whole town, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's probably it, isn't it? It's it's um, it's you being as ready as possible so that, um, yeah, so that they don't have to remember, you know, there's a lot going on in, a, in, a, in an actor's head when they're about to go into tech, they've got a lot on their minds. So it's kind of being that um, supporting role for them to make sure that they're looking after themselves um, while they're trying to concentrate on their performance, I think. Uh, I would just add in Regent's Park, um, Ali Wade was a very great stage manager that we had um, on this show called As You Like It. And I, she's been there a few times as well, but that show in particular was very interesting because with it being very hot, we had a lot of cast complain and saying, you know, we can't work in these conditions, this is unacceptable and all of that. And so the company manager really has to be ready and on the ball for those kind of weather chats, as we like to say. And um, yeah, something handy if you ever work outside is when the actors get in that mood and they're going, oh, it's too hot and this is dangerous conditions and all of this, you just have to say to them, you know what, the legal requirements here in the UK, at least when it comes to working outdoors, is very vague. It doesn't say at this temperature all work stops. And what I've found is also to remind them, you know, they are actors on a stage with ice packs, a stage management team handing them ice cold drinks, everything ready for them. The people working on the train tracks in full PPE are still working outside and they're not complaining like you guys are. So, you know, like those are the kind of chats you have to have as the company stage manager or company manager working outdoors. And you'll have a lot of them complain about rain. You'll have a lot of weather complaints. It's too cold. It's too hot. It's too windy. All of this. Uh, and so, like Beth said, a lot of the company management part of working outdoors is health and safety 
Um, and you just have to be on the ball in terms of is the stage too slippery before the cast even notices. So you have to call those show stops. You have to be ready to say, you know what, we're going to push through this. Like very often on um, the, the, no, the uh, Jesus Christ Superstar we just did now during COVID, a lot of that was the company manager saying, you know what, you're not supposed to dance as much as you're doing. Tone down the choreography and we can continue in this drizzle rain. I know you don't like it, but what would you rather, go home at 10 o'clock or would you go home at 11 o'clock? Because if we do a show stop right now, you're not going home until 11 o'clock. So, you know, you kind of have to, you, you kind of have to be a strict mum. But I guess that's a lot of what it is being a company manager. I have to say one of the, um, um, you're right, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of sort of mumming that you end up doing um, and keeping morale, keeping morale high as well. I think one of the, one of the best moves we ever made um they just kept up and going we had an incredibly rainy tech it was it was it was constant and everybody was tired and everybody was just sort of done with the rain um and the producers could see that and we sort of had a, a chat um and actually the best move at that point was to stop um we, we'd got to about eight o'clock um everybody was just knackered um and so the decision was made to stop Get everyone out of costume and actually um uh they they took everyone for for pizzas um just to get them warm get them happy um and it just meant that when everyone came back the next day and it was still raining um they had those thoughts and those feelings and oh we were so looked after and we you know uh, uh, which just made everybody's life um a hundred times better the next day so sometimes sometimes you're right it's absolutely about keeping people pushing on but also sometimes it's about recognizing when the limit has been reached um, and not asking people to pu to push beyond, um, you know, where they're comfortable, um, just to make sure that the actual end product is it has been you know has reached in the right time. Um, and yeah, and that was one of and yeah, and that was one of the best companies, and they were they were kind of brought together by it, and actually it became one of our favorite companies we've had for a long time, just because they sort of they sort of banded together and. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, it was one. Of, it was a really lovely, really lovely summer. After that, it didn't rain so much after the tech week, which was great. <laughs> Brilliant! Thank you for those. Um, so we will move on to the first of our live questions. Um, ha in a lot of venues, you might not have an obvious backstage where you can hide people. So, how have you, on previous shows, dealt with this? Um, have you had to have costume stage management? Um, how do you protect? The privacy of the actors if they've got changes tell us a bit about how you manage that um so we'll go first to casey um i i'm i'm, I'm thinking um uh, about this this question because we we have huge masking issues at at our theaters and the the lake Tahoe shakespeare festival our backstage is literally uh, the beach where people can, you know, kind of sometimes hang out. We have security guards, but that doesn't keep everybody away. And then we have um, a set of stairs that lead down to the dressing rooms um, and, and kind of the small green room area, as well as our storage, um, prop storage. You are right, 100%. Uh, that is that is a thing in outdoor theater. But um, we usually set up quick change booths in um, the places where we know people are, are most hidden. Um, and uh, and make sure that they have what they need in in those sections. Um, we we call our backstage areas bays in in um, our two outdoor theaters. So like bay one, bay two, bay three, et cetera, going from downstage to upstage. And we know that you know bay one, you can see everything. So no changes in bay one. And part of what we talk about in rehearsal is like if you want somebody to come in from that area, you have to know that they're going to probably be seen by some of the audience and you may want to move them upstage to, to Bay 2, et cetera. Um, I think one thing that our producer does really well is anytime we have new guest directors, we talk to them about the fact that there's there's not a lot of hiding um, in, in what we do. Outdoor theater, it's not magical or, or you know, in, in terms of how certain things happen. So yes, there, there might be um, crew in costume. That's something that I've encountered a lot more in outdoor theater 
um, or actors doing set changes or doing, you know, helping and assisting and facilitating uh, movements from one moment of the show to the next. Um, it, to, to just kind of acknowledge that, you know, we're, we're outside, we don't have you know, flying scenery and things that you otherwise might have indoors and um, make it work for the world of the play, you know, and you, and I think those things are talked about a lot for us in rehearsal and design meetings. And um, as we start to look at quick changes and all of those things and, and how we best serve the show with what we have. And at times that might mean re-examining uh, the 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 how fancy something looks, or uh, reevaluating how something can be achieved in a different artistic way that that serves the show, but looks better, you know, for lack of a better word, um, that that's going to look better uh, outdoors than it would indoors, where you're guaranteed that it's pitch black backstage and nobody's going to see what's happening. Um, so I, I think it's a little bit about establishing really solid kind of quick change areas. If you have people who have to change uh, backstage and and could potentially be uh, invisible, uh, making sure that that's a priority in creating whatever that is. Um, and, and also just making sure that the director understands all of the options that exist and some of the limitations that the venue might have. Excellent, thank you. Can we go to Beth? Uh, yeah, absolutely right. Um, managing expectations is super important. Um, if there are no quick change sp spots available stage left, then you know there there is a degree of contriving it to to say that person will be exiting stage right because they have a complete costume change to a different character, um, which may inquire, uh, in, uh, include different makeup uh, and a mustache. You know, you can't be doing that um, uh, behind the trees. Um, uh, a lot of what we do ends up being um, uh, walk with confidence, um, trying to find um, the points in the show that are the least um, intrusive. Um, so obviously, um, if you're going from a quick change tent um, to your next position and you have to cross behind the stage or in line in, in eye line of the audience, um, obviously the best times are to walk through on scene changes. But sometimes it's quite charming to see um, uh, you know, someone in character walking to their walking down to the to the pub um, during a scene because uh, it can really it can work and it can kind of make it feel like the, the it's kind of like the whole world is still continuing. It's not just one one moment on stage. Um, I have been costumed before. I think we probably all have at one point, um, uh, whatever that may be, whether it's a scout or a train driver. Um, but yeah, I would say a lot of what we do is just accept that we're not in a normal venue, um, walk sensitively, but with purpose. And actually it's, um, it, it's, it's much less, um, uh, it's much better than trying to duck and dive behind things. Cause that's more likely to draw the eye than someone just going, right, I'm going, thank you. I'm there. Um, yeah. Walk with confidence. I'd say for sure. Walk with confidence, something that we will take into our outside life as well. <laughs> uh, Just generally. <laughs> Can we go over to Ida, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, what both Beth and Casey said, it's all about planning and grabbing, I think, that piece of information and hold it tight and know when to speak up in rehearsals before it becomes an issue. Um, I'm usually a bit too good at this. <laughs> Very much, I'll be like, oh, by the way, have you thought about this? By the way, you know it's far from stage left to stage right, you know? And um, yeah, very often you have to kind of, you have to assess both your director and your actors. Like some actors will be brilliant. They will walk off stage as soon as they know they can't be seen by the audiences. They throw the t-shirt off. They start undressing as they walk further towards the quick change stent. But then there's other actors, maybe um, older, more traditional actors or someone who has, for some reason, don't feel comfortable being in view. And you have to respect that as well. And so then that becomes between stage management and costume collaborating on, okay, where's the best place for them? Again, on Jesus Christ Superstar, we had to use one of the containers that lighting usually stores all their flight cases and equipment in, 
because that was the nearest stage right quick change area because there was no other way of putting gazebos up or being mindful of the band which had to be separated because of COVID. So where we usually had our quick change tent now had to be a band tent. So again, like you have to just, you have to just take that into consideration before it becomes an issue. Um, and yeah, as Beth said, we've all been in costume on stage. There's been multiple times where you just have to go on because certain items are dropped or clothing is dropped. Uh, again, on Evita, there was a certain coat that went flying. So, you know, you just have to walk on confidence, take it, grab it, get off. Because audiences won't notice that. They will notice you creeping around. Um, and yeah, just manage expectations, talk to your director. Don't be afraid of highlighting something to your director. Obviously, you know, some directors can be a bit difficult. So, you know, make a friendship with them first, but don't be afraid to mention it because the worst thing is for them to come into tech and say, why the fuck didn't anyone tell me? There's a tree in the way where I wanted this. You know, you, you just better say it twice. Perfect, well, thank you so much. Very good answers. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next topic now, which is all about careers. So just sort of like the general skills and stuff like that. So what sort of skills or qualities do you recommend for working outdoors? Uh, Beth, if we'd like to start with you. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, I think something uh, I think every stage manager knows is um, uh, what, what, what do they say? Uh, wait till you're in the <laughs> in the bathroom to cry. Um, no, it's 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 about um, it, it's about trying to be that optimistic um, person of confidence that people can trust and and rely on to, to have the right answer or if not the right answer immediately will get you the right answer um there are no problems um there's just ways of fixing things and if it can't be um this exact way okay well we that's not you know that's not going to be possible but how about this this could be a really good way of doing it um uh, you know looking in, into different ways of solving things um i think is key um um, taking in lots of other suggestions, you know, if you've got a full team, if you're lucky enough to have, you know, an ASM and a DSM and a CSM, you know, uh, listening to everyone and, and, and letting other people help problem solve as well, um, I think is good. Um, yeah, um, specialist, specialist skills. Um, I mean, if you can't sew on a button, um, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> um, you've got to <laughs> or, or glue that button on. Um, you, you, you do need to have, I think, a basic level of um, fix all, really. Um, it might not be the fix for the whole show, but um, you've got to have quite a cool head to, to look at a problem and go, right, OK, what can we do immediately? What can we do by the end of the show? What can we do by the next show? um and just kind of think of it like that um uh yeah go ahead um yeah problem solving um i would just say positive 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 because if someone sees the stage manager um um going oh this is oh this is terrible this is terrible then what confidence are they going to have to try and continue um always try and be that 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 person that they can rely on to to be cool and calm and collected and and you can get through anything Lovely, thank you so much. Um, Ida, yourself? Yeah, very much the same. Uh, I would say personally, I rely so much on being flexible, just regardless of what the issue is, be flexible. And again, like uh, Beth said, there's no problems. Uh, if anything, I go around on stage and I shout, what is that, a problem? No, it's not, it's a challenge. And I do that all the time because, you know, it kind of, after a while, pisses people off. But in the first five minutes, they're like, yeah, okay, it is a challenge. Yeah, maybe I should see it as a challenge. Yeah, all right, let's do this. Yeah, let's get together. And I also find if I was to hire someone for an outdoor theatre production, I would want them to be a person who really 
like yeah, Beth said, a person of confidence, but that confidence also has to, to enable you to be able to speak up and to know when to speak up and to not take yourself too seriously. So, you know, if you're erasing issues that is uh, about prop storage or um, if your director wants something to happen and he wants it to happen now, you have to be that person who keeps you cool and you're calm and collected and you just go up to them and you go, I'm really sorry, that is not possible right now. And then you explain to them why it's not possible. Because if you just, if you don't explain things, then you might as well just go the other way because people won't listen to you if they don't understand why something can't happen. So again, you have to be that person of confidence who keeps calm and if you don't have an answer, you say, that's fine. I'll find the answer for you. Just give me two minutes. It'll be sorted. Leave it with me. I'll fix it. You know, and again, like Beth said, you have to just fix it. That comes in with the whole don't take yourself too seriously. Make it work right now. It's not going to be the, the solid fix, but it's just going to be something. And yeah, be proactive. I would say is is the most important thing, especially working outside. You know, if there is branches everywhere, leaves on the stage, don't be the person who goes, oh, we need to mop the stage. Grab a mop, grab some people, make that happen. You go, oh, actually, the leaves are falling quite badly now because we're going into autumn. Should we sweep the stage once now just to get the worst of it off? And then we'll do another sweep at the half hour call. You know, come with those suggestions. Show me that you are thinking about these things and show me that you're not afraid to get mucky because you will. You will get bird poo all over you. You will be covered in dust and you can't, you just can't take yourself too seriously. So be flexible, problem solving and just positive, like Beth said. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Casey, yourself? I think uh, those were two great answers that I, I really just want to echo in terms of um, flexibility, adaptability, acknowledge that things are going to go wrong and that you can't plan. If, you know, you can't always plan the elements. You can't, you know, it, there are just certain, uh, you know, pieces of the puzzle that you're working with that are going to be different and, uh, and, and, and acknowledging that and kind of moving forward with that as, as exactly what was said, that kind of cool, calm, collected, attitude. Um, in terms of kind of um, uh, practical, you know, kind of, of uh, things to think about, and, and I think these are true with indoor theater as well, but I thought I'd draw attention to like CPR, first aid, additional trainings um, for, for being outside. You know, um, here in the States, we have various like wilderness trainings for people who like to go camping or do like, you know, outdoor excursions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, those could be helpful, you know, they could be useful in terms of how, you know, outdoor survival skills and, and, um, you know, if, if you want to learn more about kind of indigenous plants, wildlife, like are there trainings, are there classes in your area that might give you a little bit more uh, just kind of practical knowledge about, you know, the elements that you're dealing with, but um, it, those are the practical things that come to mind, but in terms of, you know, skills, qualifications, in terms of, um, how you approach the job. I think so much of it is with a sense of humor, with a smile, at just acknowledging that things are going to go wrong. And that's, that's part of it, you know, and as uh, you know, I, I love what you just said, Ida, about that's a challenge. And I, I might steal that from you because that's just brilliant. Um, you know, because it's true, you know, there are, there are a million different, you know, contingency plans and, and, and things. And, um, you know, one of the, the quotes that I love is be proactive, not reactive and proactivity was brought up, you know, you don't want to react to the situation. You want to be proactive about, uh, troubleshooting potential issues before they arise. So, um, again, just want to echo the two brilliant answers that came before me. And, and I think that's, that's what to look for really. Can I just add on, I don't know if it's the same, uh, or I know it's not the same in the US because you have such strong unions and such a, a strong divide between departments, but especially for me in Regent's Park and probably on smaller outdoor productions, uh, I would say collaboration is key. Like understand the bigger picture of different departments, uh, understand what lighting needs, what sound needs, and have that collaboration with them because 
as I mentioned at the very start of this, when the rain comes, everyone who's worked in Regent's Park knows where the squeegees are and they know how to squeegee the stage and they just get on with it. And lighting will very often, uh, like Casey said, they'll put on the rain cue, flood the stage with lights, keep it warm, and then they'll come and help us because they know as well, the longer it takes us to squeegee the stage, the longer they have to stay. So it, it, it becomes a little bit like, OK, know when stage management needs help, but also know when sound need help to cover the microphones, to collect um, all electricity that you have on stage. And, and like Casey just mentioned, it is going to it is going to go wrong. So just be prepared for it. It's don't don't take yourself too preciously and uh, and be open for, for collaboration. And positivity begets more positivity, doesn't it? If you if you approach every situation um, with a willingness to solve whatever whatever the situation is, the next time something happens, the person that you've solved a problem for is more likely to be more flexible and positive with you um, and looking for solutions. If you if you shut something down and say that's a that's an issue, no, that's an issue, then they're not going to feel like they're not going to want to feel sort of giving to you the next time round. So I think, it, you know, keeping that sort of positive problem solving um, mindset um, kind of encourages other people to do the same thing. It just makes for a um, it just makes for a much more smooth and happy run and, and have a laugh as well. Oh, my goodness. You know, don't take yourself too seriously. It's it's a lovely thing you're doing, but um, uh, it's a show at the end of the day. Um, you know, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. Um, and my other favourite thing is um, is is that the audience only know what you show them. Um, so at the end of the day, um, they get the show that you've given them. And if something's slightly different for whatever reason, they don't know the difference. So it's you know it's just trying to have that that sort of that mentality of um, we're going to get this done in the best and greatest way possible. But we're also not going to hate ourselves if something is something tiny has changed or we've had to adapt like you know you're, you're all working together and um you know creating that kind of like family environment is is really nice and just makes it more more fun for everyone doesn't it mm, i would say it's it's definitely more like you said a family environment in uh, in a similar way to touring because you're going through these extreme experiences together you're going through the rain you're going to uh through the wind, like wind is a massive issue for sound. If it's too windy and you're holding microphones on stage, you can't hear anything. That that could be a show stop. So then you have to take into consideration the implications of a show stop or the weather conditions for other departments as well as for yourself. Um, and yeah, like I would add on a person in stage management who is not ready in an outdoor theater venue to go on stage you might as well forget about it, mate. There is so many things that get lost on stage that you have to go and retrieve in the interval or certain interval changes requires you to go on stage. If something goes wrong, you're most likely to be sent on uh, scene changes where a cast suddenly has got heat stroke. You're doing it instead. All of this, you have to be prepared to do it. Like on Peter Pan, I was ass up in the air trying to fix one of the sliders in the middle of the interval. All my friends thought it was hilarious to send me pictures of it because they were like, is this part of the show or are you just wanting to show off? I was like, can't take it too seriously. You have to just be willing to, to muck in where you need to muck in. I think that's perfect. I think there's going to be a good few quotes from here, like positivity begets positivity and all that. <laughs> um, so I know you've already touched on this one. So if this would just be just a very quick one, one, one thing that you would recommend to have in your toolkit and we'll start with Casey. This is a personal thing, but um, bring an extra pair of shoes for yourself. Um, and just keep them at the theater and just know that they're, they're there. And uh, the, the moment that you're, nobody likes wet socks. Um, so, you know, just, just have an extra pair of shoes, extra pair of socks just with you that lives at the theater. Um, that's kind of my, my little thing. You know, I always have my rain jacket, you know, but I think that it's, it's those little personal comforts that can sometimes just make your attitude a little bit better. 
Um, and, and I think there's a security for me in knowing that I have dry socks in the, in the storage, in the event that, uh, that my feet get wet. Um, so, you know, I would say, um, whatever, whatever that is for you, you know, if there's something else that just kind of makes sure that, you know, uh, if you have a little creature comfort that, that you can keep in your toolkit to, to make sure that if you're having a actual rainy day that you can, uh, you can feel, you can feel a little better. So that's, that's my, that's my personal quirky suggestion. That's so lovely. <laughs> um, Beth, yourself? Um, it's a bit of a weird one. Um, a hot glue gun stick and a lighter um, would be mine. It's um, saved me a couple of times. Um, uh, obviously hot glue gun, hot, hot glue is one of the only glues that dries uh, within a, within a couple of seconds. Um, uh, and you don't have to wait for the glue gun to heat up or be near electric, um, uh, to use it. And it's good to have in your, if you have a, uh, I don't know if many of you have like a stage management, uh, apron or, um, or cargo pants that have lots of pockets, um, as well as safety pins. It's one of my, one of my favorites cause it can, it can get you out of trouble, um, pretty quick. That is absolutely brilliant. I'm stealing that. Um, and either yourself. Yeah, they both kind of mention both things that I keep with me. I always have a change of clothes and shoe. Um, I've got into a bit of a ha bad habit of saving it. So I don't change it because I'm like, oh, no, I could get wetter tomorrow. So I better save it. But yeah, when when it rained and the costume tents just collapsed on us, um, that was definitely a lifesaver to be able to change into a new comfortable set of clothes. Um, I would also say, personally for me, fluorescent gaff tape, the really good stuff, because that sticks and you can see it. Forget about glow tape. Glow tape will disappear and be lost because it rains. But the fluorescent gaff actually stays really well compared to all other tape, as well as um, cable ties and snips, because you can always use cable ties. You can't use... Um, tape and stuff outdoors so yeah that's definitely my my three favorites perfect thank you and uh the final one within our careers sort of topic is sort of a classic one because obviously this is SM nest so uh what advice would you give a student or early career professional sort of looking to get involved with outdoor theater um Ida we'll start with you uh, I would say a lot of what we said about what we're looking for in a person working outdoors. So have that flexibility, have that knowledge of all the departments and have that confidence and positivity. Um, personally, I would also suggest kind of interestingly crewing because I don't feel like stage management in theatre is always preferred prepare you as well as crewing does for outdoor theater because a lot of the times when you're working outdoors you have to do the repairs you have to be able to lift things and a lot of the experience you get from crewing will be lifting things out of vans to outdoor sites and and dealing with a lot of of tools so yeah, it's it's unconventional for me to rec recommend crewing and and that in stage management, but that is definitely something I saw helped me. And also, be outside, get used to nature. Like, don't be afraid to get wet. Honestly, crew, some of the hardest workers known to man. Honestly, <laughs> um, Beth, yourself, um, volunteer, um, go and get involved. Go, um, go to some local companies and make yourself memorable. Um, be that person, like you, like, like you were saying, um, Ida, like be the one who picks up the brush first, um, be the one who, um, who, who uses their instinct and their intuition and, and, and just does it and just solves problems rather than waiting to be told something. Uh, you know, if you, can, if you can turn around and someone's already fixed a problem that you've only just spotted, then that person is gonna be the first person you go to when you've got some paid work. Um, um, crewing is really important, you're so right. Um, going and learning those basic skills that makes you stand out um, from other people. Um, if, if, if the first time you picked up a drill is your first day on a job, um, you know, you're gonna find yourself uh, in a bit of trouble. 
um, learn those basics, um, make yourself in invaluable and, and you, you won't ever suffer for work. Perfect. And yourself, Casey? I think um, coming into a job with a willingness to learn, uh, you know, working with as many different people as you can, who all have different styles, who all have different um, capabilities and being willing to, to learn, uh, a willingness to be trained, um, you know, a, a willingness to be flexible and adaptable. And, and, and as Beth and Ida said, you know, the ability to kind of come in and do the job that needs to be done, I think is, is really important. I also um, think know the protocols, know the chain of command, know um, the emergency information, you know, know kind of know to ask those questions as you go into tech and into performances in terms of um, how to keep people safe and, and, and what things you might really need to, to look out for. Um, you know, ask for tips, ask for advice, talk to other people who work in other venues who, who encounter other situations. You know, I've learned things today, which is very exciting, you know, from my other, my fellow panelists. So I think it's, it's important to remember that um, every process, every venue, every team is going to be so different. And um, it, just continue to explore, continue to learn, take advantage of any opportunities that you can and make sure that you know um, the safety protocols when you're walking into a, a new situation. Yeah, I really want to just emphasize that before you start again, sorry. Uh, if you don't know, ask, honestly, like always explore, always ask, don't wait for someone to tell you because they are too busy thinking about their show. So you make sure you have that information, you make sure you know everything about that venue. And if you can't find it out, if your production manager is too busy to send you a schedule, everything is online. Go online, put that schedule in your diary, be proactive, not reactive, as uh, Casey said, and, and never, never be afraid to ask questions. Just ask as much as you want, because then at least you're willing to learn. How appropriate for this chance to ask series. <laughs> Um, so we will finish with one final question, um, asking each of you, what is it about open air theatre that is so special? What do you enjoy so much about doing it? So let's go to Beth first. Oh, that's a big question for the last one. I love it. Um, what's not to love? Um, if you're doing a show where you're supposed to be in a woods and you can, and you can walk your, your audience through a real wood, with the real breeze and the real bird song like there's nothing there's nothing quite like it is there um i did a show once where uh, we had about four or five different stops on this huge loop of these big grounds and at one point um uh, two cast members rode up on a rowboat and got out and started their scene like you can't do that in a theater and and i love theater i love you know i love uh, i love all theater but i think there's something about outdoor that just takes you to a different level um you know, it, 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 it's it's those little moments like seeing the sunset behind you, or or oh, we did a, a 1940s show, at, and during the matinee, um, RAF three RAF planes flew overhead, completely fluke, um, and it couldn't have been more perfect. And um, everyone was like, "How did they arrange that?" Um, uh, and it was just wonderful. So there's those little magical moments I think that you find in in outdoor theatre that uh, just just aren't as common. I don't think indoors. I love it. I think it's brilliant. Thank you. Let's go to Casey. I have to agree. I mean, I think there's something about the the experience of just being immersed in an in, in an outdoor environment and watching. Uh, watching a, a piece of art and um, it's just a different experience and I and I really enjoy um, for me it's also so much about the venue and the, the how special it is to come back and work with the same people from year to year and uh, and in community like we've created you know kind of a, a community together and there's something that's really special about dealing with the hot days and the, the the cold nights and the squirrels and the bears, you know, and, and all of these things that it, it just keeps you on your toes in a way that um, that that gives an element almost of surprise that it's like, oh, this is what happens today. You know, um, we we once my my bears, we once walked out of the venue to the parking lot and there was a bear literally in somebody's car because they had left chewing gum in their car and the bear had managed to open the door and was sitting in the driver's seat of the car. And like, 
would that happen if we were doing theater indoors? I mean, maybe, but it, probably not, you know? And so there's just these little kind of elements of surprise. And, you know, as Beth said, like watching the sunset every night, just having an audience who's really immersed in an experience. And I don't know, I feel like it takes us back to our roots of what, you know, theater was, you know, so long ago and, and, and why we do it. And so I think it's just kind of, I, I really enjoy that kind of, you know, communing with nature and, and with the, the people. Thank you, and that's of all either. Yeah, both of what Beth and Casey have said is absolutely spot on. Uh, I think what Casey said about community is so true because you have to remember that the audience is also part of that community. We have some proper patrons who loves sitting in the rain and you always get a big applause when the company stage manager comes out on stage and goes, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, it's raining, as you can see, so we'll have to stop the show. You know, you get a big applause and the audience is there like pushing that positivity and they want to see the show finish. They really do. They don't want it to cancel. They're here for this one performance. And that's also what they're paying for in their ticket price. That one performance is a one-off. I know there are one-offs in theater, in a, in a venue, but it's something else when one day you have brilliant sunshine in this really scary moment. And then the next day you have thunder and lightning. Like it creates two completely different scenarios. And, uh, and I think outdoor theater just reminds us that we're all alive and connected. Like both cast, crews, squirrels and audiences. We're all alive and we're all connected, even the trees, you know, like we're all adding to the performance in our own special way. And uh, yeah, it comes down to that community feeling of we're all here together. And yeah, even audiences, they love seeing the squeegees. They cheer you on if you squeegee real bad. Um, and they love the, the, the summer as well, sitting there in a matinee with the pims nothing better than it. I love that. Cast, crew, screw as an audience. Um, right, so thank you so much to everyone for this evening, especially our panelists for giving up your time to share your experience with us. It's been so interesting learning about this specific area of stage management, especially considering it will be one of the first forms of theatre to come back to us as we return to normality. 